just, every year when we go through the Christmas story, there's so many parts that just kind of mess with my mind. I mean, he came to the shepherds. The angel of the Lord came on God's behalf to the shepherds. The lowliest, the job that no one wanted to do. There's so many things about the Christmas story that are amazing. This morning is just a couple of things that I want to touch on just before we begin uh, the message part of our service. Um, every Christmas we do we do a whole bunch of things to kind of help uh, people and and uh, and uh, we do that all year round. But Christmas is a time that we really try to to make an effort. Uh, we send boxes away and we do things uh, for people in our area. Uh, but we have one more thing that we have an opportunity to help with this year. And I have 10 kids that either one or both of their parents will be in jail this Christmas. And this would quite possibly be the only gift they'll get. And so this is what I need uh, at the end of the service. There is 10 of them here. It tells you the age. Uh, the amount, and you can only spend $25, okay? There's multiple kids in, in some of the houses, so if Eileen takes one and spends 50, and somebody else spends 25 on the other kids, so they want to keep it as fair across the board. Um, but the kids have requested something. So what happens with these gifts is, is we buy a gift, you take a name today, you buy a gift, it has to be returned next Sunday. Unwrapped uh, with this card, uh, with it and then we will wrap it we will get it ready and somebody from grace church will deliver it uh, to these people but they will deliver it they won't know it's from grace church it'll be deli delivered delivered on behalf of their parent or their parents that are going to be in jail and so i would really encourage everybody they'll be right here and right after church uh, you can grab one also if you've been reading or, or along with us in our advent calendar or if you weren't here last week, there's actually an Advent reading for every day, and you can grab one back at the connection point. Uh, and it's just a way to kind of reflect a little bit every day on the reason for the season. Last thing, uh, we have a dinner theater tonight. I really encourage everyone to get your tickets today. Uh, we do have a little bit of room left, so please keep that in mind. But right after church, we need to clear this room out. And so we do need some help, and then we need to bring tables and chairs in. Uh, so right after church, uh, if anyone who's willing to help us move these chairs, um, we'll give some direction of how to do that. And uh, if you don't want to help them, we'll just have a dinner theater on the floor. It'll be no problem. Uh, so please do that today. Uh, so we've been working our way through Advent. Last week we talked about joy, uh, with about hope. Today we're going to talk about joy. Last week, just a quick review. There's this tension when we talk about about hope. And it's this tension about looking to the future, this future hope. But we also live in this tension of, of the past. And a lot of times we picture hope as just this optimistic outlook on the future. And it's good to be optimistic. How many know someone who's always optimistic, always sees the bright side? How many see someone who's always pessimistic? Don't point to them if they're here. Uh, but you know, but it's always good to be optimistic. But hope is, we have this hope for the future. This is the first advent that we're celebrating Christ coming to earth. But there's a second advent that's coming, and that is Christ's return. But hope and the tension that we live in with hope is that we, need to, we can have hope because we serve a never-changing God. I've walked with God long enough in my life, and many of you have in this room, where you know that, that God has been faithful to you through the years. It's more than just this optimistic hope for the future. We say things like, I hope I find someone to marry. Or I hope things turn out okay. Or you're running a gas and you say, I hope someone comes and helps me along the way. But true hope is more than just this optimistic look in the future. That's part of it. But the tension is about living and remembering the faithfulness of God in the past. I have hope for the future, 
Because my hope is anchored in an ever-changing God. Not just, in time, not just in times gone by, but God is faithful all the time. But being able to look back now and look to see what God has brought you through. I mean, all of us have gone through tough times. Every single person in this room. And when you're in the middle of those tough times, it's hard to see that God is with you. How many of you ever felt like God has abandoned you? I know I have. But when you anchor yourself to a never-changing God, you can rest assured that God is with you. How many know that our emotions change? Our circumstances change. Jobs change. Health changes. Families change. But God never changes. God is a God of hope. We have hope for the future. A hope that is anchored in the past. Advent is about expectation, arrival. We are celebrating the first Advent. Today, we're going to talk about the second candle of Advent, and that is joy. And I would like five volunteers, so I'm not going to embarrass you, I promise. I need five volunteers. Anybody? All right. Gabrielle, Nathan, Manette, that's three. Come over on this side here. So we don't catch on fire. All right, Murray and Rock. All right, come on up. All right. Speed it up, fella. All right. All right. So, as quick as you can, name one thing that makes you happy. <laughs> One thing that makes me happy? Yep. Peace? That's what I wanted to say. <laughs> Alright. One thing that makes you happy? I was going to say peace. That was my first. Okay. Ryan? Oh! 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 He says Mariah, now he, Murray says Barbara. <laughs> I was going to say my whole family. You're going to say your family. Okay. Alright. So if we started getting more people, we don't have time, but if we started getting more people, you guys said peace, so that's a good answer. Uh, your guys' answer's a little shaky. Uh, no, it's good. But the truth is, is that most of the things mentioned, those circumstances can change. Families change. So for example, someday, Rock's girls are gonna move, are gonna get up and they're gonna move away. It seems like you're going to love that idea right now. But your family will change. And if you base your happiness, emotions change, circumstances change, situations change. If we look to our spouse, which is not a bad thing, you probably made brownie points, good for you. Uh, I'm sure someone will tell her. But if you base your happiness on a spouse. Those things change. You're not going to be as in love. Oh, I'm not going to say that. You guys can sit down. But our, our situations always change. You say, well, I'm happiest when I'm with my spouse. But happiness is an emotion that can change really I mean, how many have ever been having a very good day and then all of a sudden something happened and you had a bad day? Or the truth is, most times days are going pretty good, but we have a bad moment and we let that bad moment ruin the rest of the day. Because not generally does the whole day stink. But something happens and it changes our day. And a moment can change the feeling of happiness into another feeling. We read Luke 2 earlier. And it, we won't read it again, but the first words that the angel says are, Fear not, I bring you good news of great joy. The angel of the Lord appeared with shepherd where nobody would ever thought that the angel of the Lord would appear. 
to someone like him. He says, I bring you great joy. Happiness is an emotion and it's based on outward circumstances. So you wake up in the morning, things are going good, and you go and you're whistling as you get ready, and then you go and you realize you're out of coffee. Some people here, I don't drink coffee because I'm just too healthy for that, but, <laughs> but not having coffee on a morning can change the whole direction of your day. How many have ever done something permanently stupid because you were temporarily upset? We all have. Have you ever got upset and said something that you know that you shouldn't say? We live in a very emotional society. <coughs> if you haven't noticed, just go spend a half an hour on Facebook. And people do it every day. Every day, someone says, I don't usually do this, but here's my rant. <laughs> yeah, you do usually do it. You did it yesterday. Because we're very emotional. And we think that all of our emotions need to be... And our feelings rule everything. And we live by this motto, and please don't tune me out after I say, but we live with this idea that God wants me to be happy. And I think God wants us to be happy, but I think we should know that God is more concerned with me being holy than he is with me being happy. Joy comes from God. It's not an outside circumstance because those emotions can change from one day from one moment to the other there's this old song that says the joy that I have the world didn't give it to me the world didn't give it and the world can't take it away this joy that I have the world didn't give it to me the world didn't give it and the world can't take it away See, happiness is based on the circumstances of our life. But joy is a fruit of the Spirit. And it's a gift of God working out through His Spirit, working out joy in our life. Number one thing that I want us to remember this morning, joy is a gift from God. Joy is a gift from God. And I believe that God wants every person in this room to live with joy. Not that the emotions would rule us, but that wherever our circumstances might go, that God would give us a joy that passes everything that we would understand. We need to understand that joy is imparted to us, is worked out in us with an encounter with God. The truth is, if we continue to be people who are far away from God, we'll always be chasing happiness. And you see it all the time in our world. But joy comes from the Lord. You can't drum up, you can't manufacture joy. But you can fake happiness. We've all done it. You've woke up, you've been in a bad mood, you've been not having a good day, and you walk to see your friends, and you're like, hello, how are you? Because you can fake happiness. But when life gets really tough, you cannot fake joy. You can pretend things are okay, you can act like things are okay, but you cannot fake joy, because joy is departed on you by an encounter with the living God. Happiness is outward. We smile, we joke, we laugh. And the truth is, if we look back over just this past year, or maybe the last two years, and we see all these celebrities that have ended their life, nobody ever thought that they were unhappy. But they were just happy on the outside. Because you can fake happiness. There are people in this room that you look happy, but inside your life there's something missing. 
I want you to know that, that something that is missing in your life is the joy. Is a relationship with God where He works out joy in your life. This can only be, can only be filled by an intimacy with God. The world is chasing joy and they don't even know it. Because they're chasing the emotion of happiness. The truth is, the church is chasing joy. I see people all the time that are Christians and they walk in and they look like they were baptized in vinegar. <laughs> like, how are you doing tonight? Good. Well, tell your face. But we're in this constantly chasing after this emotion of happiness. We've got joy and happiness confused. Because we think, and we're all guilty of it, we think that if we buy the newest and the brightest, that it's going to bring us joy. But it only brings you temporary happiness. I just got a new iPhone. And I'm like, I was waiting for this thing. It was delayed. Uh, I wanted to, to, to blow up the peer later truck. Like, it was just terrible waiting. And then I got it, and I was like, this is awesome. And I set it up five minutes later, I'm like, it's a lot like my old iPhone. <laughs> we chase it with cars, with stuff, with houses, with drugs, with alcohol, with relationships. Relationships is one of the most common things that we're chasing after something. We think if we could find the perfect person, the love of my life, and we could walk into the room and we could stare each other across the room and meet in the center and be like, you complete me. We think that it's going to be okay. I don't want to burst anybody's bubble here, and I don't want any married people saying amen. But butterflies fade. I can remember the first time I saw Penny walk through the door. The very first time. I mean, I saw her other times, but this time I saw her. <laughs> you know, like I saw her other times, I was like, yeah, she's nice. I remember where I was standing. I remember what I was thinking, which I won't say. <laughs> but I remember. I remember she walked through the door and I was like, whoa. Well, listen, we've been together for 22 years. She's walked through a lot of doors. <laughs> and every time she walks through the door, like it would be exhausting, but every time she walks through the door, I'm not like, whoa. Did you see how she walked through the door? She's walked through a lot of doors. We get caught up in life and kids and work. And if you're waiting for someone to fill the hole of joy in your life, you need to know that will not fill it. We're chasing happiness. I've heard it said before that there's a God-shaped hole in every person. And we try to fill it with all sorts of things. Relationships, drugs, alcohol. Lots of things. Roger Corliss says this, trying to be happy by accumulating or buying possessions is like trying to satisfy your hunger by taping sandwiches all over your body. Think about that. Trying to buy happiness, trying to buy joy, it's like taping sandwiches all over your body because you're hungry. <laughs> See, joy is a fruit of the Spirit. In Galatians 5, 22 and 23, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against these things, there is no law. In your mind and in your heart this morning, picture a farmer. A farmer that works the ground, trims the trees, prunes the trees, waters the trees, 
grafts the trees, digs around the trees, fertilizes the trees. The Spirit is the gardener. And the fruit of the Spirit is built in our life. True joy only comes from Him. And it comes from God working it out in us. I don't know who said this, but I saw this quote this week and it said this. Christmas reminds us that before God gave us a book to read, He sent us a person to follow. That before He gave us a book to read, the Bible, He sent us a person to follow. True intimacy, true joy, number one, is a gift from God. It can only be found in Him. But we live in a society that is forever trying to fill the hole in our life. And our emotions rule us. If anyone ever tells you that serving Jesus is going to be easy, you need to put that away in your mind and say, this person is lying to me. Because life is still hard. Emotions still want to rule us. But if we cultivate a relationship with the Almighty God in our lives, that joy can help us through the hardest of circumstances. Remember, joy is a gift from God. Number two, and this is really hard, but true joy confronts our emotions. True joy confronts our emotions. It stands up to our emotions. You see in the first line of this story, fear not, don't fear, I bring you great joy. True joy confronts our emotions. The question for us all today is what do you do when your emotions get out of whack? I ask you that question, I can't answer that question for you. And I know that it's a hard question. And it takes real honesty. But what do you do when your emotions get out of whack? When things start to get out of control in your mind or just circumstances around you, do your emotions just go in the ditch? Or do you confront them and say, okay, Troy, you're not thinking straight. God is with you. When your emotions get out of whack, how do you respond? The truth is, I know this is really hard. My guess is, if we're really honest, most of us don't confront our emotions really well. And if we don't confront them, they will control us. Fear not, I bring you joy. And if we don't confront our emotions, if we don't stand up to our emotions, if we don't take control of them, I'm not talking about, about depression and those types of things. I mean just the emotions of life. Anger. How many have ever been angry? Today. Anyone so far? We've all been angry. But what happens when you don't confront the emotion of anger? People often say, well, the Bible says that sinning is an ang is, anger is a sin. But that's not true. The Bible says don't sin in your anger. Because we're all going to get angry. Jesus got angry. He went into a temple, flipped the tables over, chased everybody out with a whip. So when someone says, what would Jesus do? Just remember, that's an option. <laughs> But if we don't confront anger, anger can turn to bitterness and unforgiveness. But we need to confront our emotions. If you find yourself being fearful and you don't confront that fear, because most of our fears are totally irrational. 
And I know that sounds difficult, but the truth is most things we're afraid of never happen. But if we don't con confront our fear, it will lead us down a road of anxiety. Professionals say that if your anxiety is an 8 or below out of 10, that you should still proceed and do what you are afraid to do. 8. I mean, that's an incredibly high that we should still confront it. Maybe you're here and you're just someone who's really has this emotion or this feeling of being confident. But if we don't stand up to that, confidence becomes arrogance and pride. Do you confront your emotions? Maybe you're here this morning and you have this desire in your heart. And if we don't watch those desires, they turn to lust. Confront your emotions. The problem is most of us lead our lives in a very emotional state. And we never stand up and say, you know what? I can't do this. I can't say this. I can't be moody like this. I can't control people's moods like this. When I walk in a room, everyone's like, oh, I wonder what he or she's going to be like today. The angel of God stood before him and said, fear not. I'm confronting your emotion. I bring you joy. Before fear, think joy. Joy is a gift from God, and joy confronts our emotion. It's a gift from God that can only be found in Him. We can't chase it, because then we're chasing happiness. True joy confronts our emotion. Joy is not a feeling. Some of the most joyful times in my entire life have been the most horrible experiences of my life. Number three, maybe you're here this morning and you say, Troy, I just don't feel joy. I don't know what it, I don't even remember what it feels like. But number three is this, joy comes in the morning. This is not saying that everyone should be a morning person. I live in a house with two people right now. I'm not going to say which one they are, but the other person in our family doesn't live there right now. And they are not morning people. Um, I'm not saying that we all have to be morning people. This is not what it's saying. It's not saying that just in the morning you should be joyful. Because if that's the case, two people in my house are really in trouble. But it's saying that during the dark times, remember, the brightness of morning is coming. In Psalm 30, kind of talks about this and wraps this for us. It says this, I will exalt you, Lord, for you lifted me out of the depths and did not let my enemies gloat or brag over me. Lord my God, I called to you for help and you healed me. You, Lord, brought me up from the realm of the dead. You spared me from going down into the pit. Sing the praises of the Lord. You, his faithful people, praise his holy name. For his anger lasts only for a moment, but his favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping may stay for the night, but rejoicing or joy comes in the morning. We need to know this morning that no matter what you're going through today, no matter how dark you feel today, God is with you. And he's waiting for you on the other side. He's with you in the journey. He was before you. He is with you and he was behind you. The same God who confronted the shepherds and said, fear not, is the same God that's here today. Because joy is a gift from God that can only be found and worked out in him. True joy confronts our emotions. Because joy is not a feeling. Joy is a fruit of the Spirit working it out in our life. And no matter how hard things are, remember that joy comes in the morning. And that it's possible to have joy in the darkness. We have to accept the gift, 
confront the emotions. This Christmas, my prayer in closing, is that, goal would, that our goal would be to live a life of joy. During our time of worship here over the next few moments, we're going to do a few things. And if you have a pen and a paper, I would encourage you to write this down. If you're here today, whether it's on your phone or on a piece of paper in your bulletin, I want you to do three things. Ask God for the gift of joy. Ask Him to work it out in you. I should tell you, it may be instantaneous, but most likely, He will work it out in your heart like a gardener works the garden. But let that journey start today. Ask God for the gift of joy. Number two, be honest. What emotion do you have to confront today? What emotion is ruling you? Are you angry? Are you fearful? Are you anxious? Are you prideful? Are you bitter? Are you unforgiving? Are you worryful? What emotion do you need to confront? Maybe you have, you're going through some sickness and you tend to starting to worry. I challenge you today that you need to confront that worry. You say, Troy, how do I do this? How do I confront my emotions? You can confront them by confessing them to God, to each other. Just say, God, I'm really afraid. Or God, I'm really angry. Just confess them. Maybe find somebody that you trust that's sitting near you. And say, can you pray for me? I just need to confess that I'm feeling. We confront them by confessing them, and we confront them by repenting of them. Maybe you just say, God, I'm so sorry that I let my anger turn to bitterness or unforgiveness or fear turn to this. So confront them by confessing or confront them by repenting or confront them by asking for help. We need each other. So the first thing I want us to do is ask God for the gift of joy. Confront your emotions today by confessing, repenting, and asking for help. And number three, is make a commitment to fight till the morning comes. Make a commitment. God, I'm going to fight till the morning comes. God, I might feel hopeless, dark, alone, but you need to know that God promises us joy. We need to ask, confront, and fight. kind of just thought your way through those. My prayer is that God would give you one thing. As we worship, that one, what is one thing you can do this Christmas to see joy worked out in your heart? Not the emotion of happiness, a joy that is found in God. And over here there's a board and there's some markers. I want you to think of one thing. How many have ever tried to make a plan and you got, I got a plan. It's 78 plan, 78 ideas long, or 54 ideas. And how many have never followed through on that plan? All of us. One thing. As you fight, as you confront, 
and as you confess, let the Spirit of God speak to you. What's one thing this Christmas, starting today, that God is calling you to do? Not to chase happiness, but to let Him cultivate joy And once you know what it is, as a step of faith, I would, if you don't have to, but as a step of faith, go to the board, grab a marker, write one, and write what God spoke to you. It could be the most simple thing. But once you've confessed, once you've confronted, and once you've made a commitment to fight, the longest journey starts with one step. Don't worry about a 12-step plan. What's the one thing that the Spirit of God is saying today? Just write number one and write it down. So we're going to worship together. So why don't you take time? Why don't you stand?